So we've got a few new people on the call um, this week. Um, I might just ask you to say hello if you haven't been on a call previously, just to introduce yourself to the group. Um, Chris, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, sorry, just unmuting myself. Hi, I'm Chris Thorpe. I'm working on developer engagement at the ODI with the Open Active team here. Um, which is something I've done before at a, a few organizations uh, before. It's nice to be doing again. Great, thanks Chris. Uh, Dan, do you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, I'm uh, Dan. I run a website called Get the Data. Um, and the idea of Get the Data is to uh, expose open data sets um, and um, clearly signpost the source and explain the license uh, and I'm trying to expose these data sets in a different way from a conventional data portal by using um, what I'm calling uh, reference applications or just um, really building out uh, rich content based on those those data sets uh, and so I'm looking at the open active data sets obviously a very rich collection of data Great, thanks. Um, and uh, Dan's going to give us a bit of a um, bit of a demo of uh, some work that he's been doing to analyze some of the published data um, on the call today. Um, so let me uh, let me share my screen, and then we'll kind of just go through what we are planning to cover today. So um, hopefully you can see my browser all right. Um, so the the plan today is to uh, get a demo from uh, Dan on the reports he's been doing, um, have a bit of a discussion around um, a couple of the properties in the existing data model, age range and gender restriction, um, looking at how those are currently being used. Um, they've come up in a couple of the discussions in the last, uh, last week or so. Um, so I wanted to kind of briefly discuss some ways forward in improving some of the data quality there. Um, and also discuss amenities. Um, then uh, Nick's gonna give us an update on the work that um, he's been doing with Phil and Chris uh, around the booking API. Um, and then is there anything else that anyone wants to raise? We will hopefully have a bit of time at the end. Um, so I'm gonna try and hand over now to Dan. Uh, Dan, do you wanna do a, a screen share to, to, so you can drive your demo? Okay. All right. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So this is um, the homepage of Get the Data. And I just quickly, uh, to make life easier, added a link to the um, open active data profiles at the bottom. Uh, so that opens up um, this page. Um, just to introduce the concept of a data profile uh, before um, having a look at, at some examples. Um, when I was uh, trying to work with um, the data feeds from the point of view of a data consumer, um, I uh, was um, struggling a bit with the, the kind of the richness of the data structures. Uh, so different publishers obviously have uh, adopted um, the, uh, the opportunity model to different extents. Some haven't at all, some have. And within the opportunity uh, model, there's also um, a variety of ways of, uh, of um, structuring the same data. So uh, the idea of the data profiles is to crawl the entire uh, data set in, in the feed for each publisher and then try and pull out the, the structure and some examples of um, data uh, for each of the fields. Um, so if we start with an example, uh, the, these, uh, by the way, this list here, so this list is um, people who actually follow the uh, real-time data paging model. Um, and these people don't, so unfortunately it hasn't been possible to create a data profile for them at this stage, although it might be 
a more flexible approach might work with those guys. Um, so if we start with uh, having a quick look at some of these, I'll start with ActiveView, who are uh, pretty compliant, so a good, good example to start with. Um, so the data profile gives them some sort of basic information, the number of items, uh, the last time um, this system actually fetched their data and built a profile, uh, so that was this morning. Um, and then the number of items of each state in the feed. Uh, so uh, in this case, I've got 305 items that are updated and 121 that are deleted. Uh, this is a bit of a, a beta at the moment about uh, basically the, the kind of frequency of each uh, item per by start date. Um, so where those items are currently falling in a, in a calendar, a little bit of work to do there. Uh, and, and this is really where the main data profile starts on this data structure section. So here I've taken the, um, e each of the fields and mapped them out uh, in, into a path. Uh, so you, you can see which fields um, Active Newham are, are using and, and how they've structured those fields. Uh, where you see this little zero here, that means you've got a, a, a sequential array there. Um, then if you click uh, any one of these fields, so if we click, for example, uh, the location field, we've got a bit more information about that field. So you can see, uh, again, here's the path. It's for location, sits under uh, data. It's every single item has this. Uh, so if you're building something that consumes this data, you, you know that um, you, you can't necessarily guarantee it's gonna be there, but you might expect that um, you know, location is going to be pretty well populated in this field and here it tells you that location is an object um, and there's a little bit of information about uh, how many elements there are within those objects and then as we go down you can see um, for each of the elements within the object that uh, yeah, field within itself uh, there's um, a, a another uh, profile of, of that item. So here, this is quite a, quite a good example really because you can see that um, for the address, they actually only have a total of six addresses for all their items, um, which presumably is all the leisure centers they cover. If there were more than 10 here, this, this list would, uh, you, you wouldn't see um, more than 10 items here because obviously the page would get a bit unwieldy. Um, so uh, there's one of these kind of information panels for each field in the uh, in the feed. Um, so that, that's the, the sort of basics of the um, data profile. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to talk through uh, briefly a few of the things that I've discovered in the process of using these data profiles. Um, so uh, one example that's quite interesting is uh, Book When. Um, but when they have structured their uh, their events um, as a sub event um, within an item. Uh, so each item can actually have multiple events within it. And if we click on the sub event to get a bit more information, you can see that um, the maximum number of uh, sub events uh, that, that we've seen in the current um, data feed is 125. So there's one item with 125 sub events within it. Uh, so that, that item obviously contains an awful lot of uh, activities, really. There's 125 uh, separate start dates and end dates and um, you know, bits of information within one item. Um, another interesting uh, field within uh, this um, particular example is, uh, if I find it, the by day field. Um, from the data consumer's point of view, the reason this is quite interesting is because this field, you can expect it to be either an array or a string. Um, so it's just something to be aware of when you're, when you're actually building out something to consume this data is some of these, um, some of these fields can be different, uh, it can be different data types. Um, that's a, uh, uh, yeah, good example of something that conforms with the um, opportunity model, but it's uh, it, yeah, it's quite an interesting interpretation of it. 
uh, GLL uh, seemed to me to be by far the biggest publisher who, who are using um, the model. Um, and uh, one thing that's quite interesting about them is uh, they don't have any deleted items. Um, so all their items are updated. And uh, it seems to me that some of their items do get removed from their feed, but they don't get deleted. So uh, this is something I've flagged with them. Um, but it's something that the data profile helps to uh, to flag if you're um, trying to work with their data. That you, you know, if you don't see any deleted items, well, that's um, because there aren't any. Uh, then um, another thing I thought was quite interesting is uh, the way locations are handled. So here with Active Newham, uh, they handle their locations under data. So it's just data, location, address. So if you were trying to build some sort of parser. Uh, you would be looking for the address here on the data location address. Um, but then if you were parsing, using the same parser to parse GLL, GLL put the address under contained in place. Uh, so here you've got a different path to uh, basically the same piece of information. So something to watch out for if you were building a parser that can parse multiple feeds using the same model. Um, similar sort of thing with... Uh, start time where with active new and let's say you were building a, a, a parser and you wanted to pull out all the start times from multiple feeds um active new have the start time here we're back on the uh sorry the active new profile uh they have the start time um in let's see in the in the sub event so just there is this, the, the start date. Uh, book when have the start date here in sub event, then an element within a sequential array, then event schedule, then the start date. GLL have the start date uh, just here, just on the data. So just on those three feeds alone, you need to be looking at uh, three different uh, places to find the start date in those three different feeds, even though they all conform to the model. Um, then there's a few feeds uh, which don't conform with uh, either the RDPM or, or the opportunity model. Um, this is a good example, the table tennis, both the table tennis feeds, uh, but they've still got quite interesting data in them. So it's, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to do something with that data. Uh, and, and here you know, it just allows you to, um, to work with the, the model that they have used, which presumably maps more closely to their internal model. Um, another example with open parks, you know, very different type of uh, model again. They're actually conforming with the RDPM, but they're not uh, conforming with the opportunity model. Um, so hopefully that's a, a, yeah, a bit of an intro to uh, what I've been doing with the data profiles. Hopefully help people who are trying to work with um, more than one data feed and uh, just need to uh, grab a kind of summary of what's going on without having to manually dig into the, uh, the data. Great, uh, thanks Dan. Um, does anyone have any questions for Dan on what he's just demoed? Uh, hi Dan, it's Jamie from my local pitch. Good to see you. Um, hi, the last fetch on it would be good to ha have a time as well as a date uh, for that. Um, just I'd assume when we're getting to some of the more availability style stuff, then yeah. um, just knowing uh, kind of to the minute how recently that has been updated would be really useful. Okay, that'd be dead easy to add in. Uh, needs a little bit of thinking about because some of these fetches in themselves can take a few minutes. Um, so that time would probably be the point at which the fetch ended. Okay. Um, yeah, either would work, I think. Great. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, just a quick one. Hi, Dan. That's, this was absolutely brilliant. I wish I'd known about it a bit earlier. Um, I was just wondering if you were doing any sort of validation or is, is this just purely collecting data? I'm not doing any validation. Um, right. I think there's some uh, validation oh, yeah. 
I've seen a validator on the open active site somewhere. Uh, yeah, I think it's not, I think it's we, not something I've done, but it's uh, you know, basically through not wanting to duplicate. Okay, fair enough. Thanks very much. Thanks again. So good. Yeah, like, so the um, uh, work on a kind of validation and starting to improve the data quality is something that we need to start to make some progress on now. Um, and that's one of the things that um, uh, I think Chris is going to be able to help us. Uh, move forward with over um, the next few months. Um, it, for that piece of work, there's a couple of different angles to think about. There is um, uh, so at kind of validating whether that something actually conforms to the model. Um, but uh, one of the challenges there, as you've, you've, you've highlighted quite neatly, is that there are um, some slightly different patterns that people are using, so that all of which are kind of valid according to the way that the model is specified, but um, uh, maybe not what people are expecting. So we first need to kind of capture and identify those patterns, and the reports that you've produced are a great way to start doing that. And then we can have a discussion about, okay, are those useful things that we should be encouraging people to do? And I think they are. Um, so then how do we make sure that that's accounted for in any validator that we, we produce, but also in any documentation that we put together um, to you know, help people publish what, uh, data in consistent ways. Um, the, the approach that we've been taking from the start has been to uh, try and make the, the, the barriers as low as possible. So you know, that's why some people are publishing according to the feed but haven't adopted the data model yet. Um, some people are, are publishing to the data model, but don't have necessarily the same level of detail around addresses, et cetera. So I, the, the more we can do to kind of iterate and improve the quality of data after it's been published, the better. So that's, that's why I, I, th I think this as a resource um, is fantastic because um, we can start to draw on it in the work that we're doing in this group, as well as supporting um, developers who are starting to work with the individual feeds. Um, so, and in fact, I'm um, to, to maybe move on to the next next agenda item. Um, I've got one quick question for Dan. Yeah, sorry. Um, what does the postcode slash street search do? Um, does that drill down into individual items from the feeds? No, so that's actually just part of the main site. Okay, so it doesn't have anything to do with the open data aggregation stuff. It, it doesn't. Well, I should have pointed that out. No. So if you put something in that, you'll get a completely unrelated page back. So. Um, right. No worries. Just wondering. Just it looks amazing. Okay. By the way. Uh, thank you. If if anyone has any sort of suggestions for how these could be improved, um, then do let me know because I'm uh, I'm doing quite a bit of work on this at the moment, and um, <clears throat> I'm improving. I'm adding bits as I go along that I find useful. But if there's other things that people would find useful to see, then. Uh, then, then do let me know. Uh, an example is uh, I'd like to add uh, a, a list of all the locations covered by each feed so that you can get a quick idea of the geography that it's um, that it covers. Uh, so, so that yeah, ho hopefully these will be um, progressed over time and uh, feedback for uh, improvements very welcome. Yeah, so one suggestion um, uh, is to maybe pull out lists of activities. Yeah. Um, we still need to um, we need to kind of revive the work that we were doing last year around trying to create a standardized activity list and I think seeing what people are actually putting into that field at the moment uh, would be useful input okay so if you're able to surface any of that that'd be great I think yeah sure yeah good suggestion um, I'm gonna share my screen again now um, just move on talk about the um, Bit around a couple of properties that you've you've actually uh, you are in your reports. Um, so uh, uh, Nick and I were having a discussion uh, over the last week about um, a couple of the, <coughs> the existing properties: age range and gender restriction. Um, uh, this we've had a bit of feedback from various people who are either starting to publish data about how to use this or are consuming the data and would like to see a bit more consistency around how these fields are being used. Um, so it was on my to-do list to kind of go through some of the data sets and see what values are in there. But 
um, Dan, Dan released his data set reports at just the right time uh, and saved me, the, saved me the effort. So I've gone through the reports and for those, and uh, I've, got, I've got a spreadsheet here, um, which I'll, uh, it's linked in the slide, so I'll show it afterwards. But I've just gone through for each of the people that Dan's got a report for, indicate whether they're using the field or not. And then if they are, just, I've just noted down what values they're putting in, just to see what the variation is. So um, generally, I think people are using it in a kind of consistent way, apart from there's a couple of variations. So lawn tennis are referring to men and women rather than kind of male, female mixed. Um, sports data are just using um, slightly different case in the literal values. Um, uh, some like fusion uh, are only, have only got uh, mixed female or an empty value. Um, so no male only events in fusion apparently. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of useful because then we can kind of uh, decide what we want to do to, uh, well, if we want to do anything to improve how that has been published. Um, one suggestion we've had is to, rather than using the literal values, which um, means that we end up with uh, slightly different cases or uh, etc is to use um, some URIs that schema.org has already defined so rather than just having the text email uh, we we can refer to that um, as a URI um, just as a way to kind of um, nudge that kind of best practice on a little bit further um, so uh, if anyone's got any feedback now on the call um, you can Please chime in. Um, otherwise, I'll probably just uh, file an issue and so get to the mailing list for for comment. Sorry, was somebody going to say something? Lee, is there a um, a schema org value for mixed, or that does the equivalent thing of mixed? There, there isn't. So we would need to define that. Um, they don't have like we had a look. They don't have a value for non or equivalent for for, for mixed. So. Um, but we could define our own kind of URI for that um, and recommend what people are using. Or we could, we could suggest that they put one in. Lee, uh, you could make that gender restriction field an array and have uh, female, male, or male and female. Yep, that's, that's another way to do it, yep. So, uh, yeah, so so just to, to, um, yeah, I don't know if it's worth just highlighting another bit of the conversation we had um, before on this. So, I because I, I was talking about an array as well. That's a really good idea. But because the semantics of gender restriction are that it's a restriction, having a gender restriction of male and female in an array. Uh, well, I guess it's restricted to both male and female, so that makes sense. Um, but yeah, the conversation was basically that the array is one option, and the other option is that we define non in the namespace of open active and we then define male and female in the namespace of open active to be consistent um so i guess uh i i know that at least two implementers have already started doing the latter using the namespace of open active male female and none um but if the array works for everyone then that would save us defining stuff so uh I basically what I'm saying is let's make it make a decision whatever it is now and then we'll make sure that these two implementers don't um, have to rework yeah I, I, I think my personal preference would be just have male female or non rather than um, defining b both values as meaning non I don't um, mind I don't mind whatever the, whatever the answer is. And in that case, would you suggest doing it as a, uh, a namespace in openactive.io? Um, yeah, I know that's what uh, I, think, I think we discussed that. <clears throat> um, so uh, rather than saying use one of two values from schema.org or a value from as defined by openactive, just defining all three values in openactive and then just declaring male and female to be equivalent to what um, schema.org define ends up with the same goal. It's that. Um, We've got uh, a clear set of values that people will use in their data, um, and behind the scenes, the kind of semantics all kind of works as well. So, so I think that's the direction we go in. But I just kind of wanted to highlight that that's that we're likely to make some change to that property based on kind of existing usage. 
um, the, the other one was age range, um, which is more problematic, um, as you might expect. Um, so again, using uh, Dan's um, reports, I've just been through, and this probably doesn't display particularly well, but I just pulled out what values people are using. Um, Fusion is marked as red because the age range is attached to the wrong thing. So they've got it, but it's attached to the offer rather than the, um, the event. So that's a kind of validation issue. Um, but they either have empty values uh, or zero to 15 or exactly 16 years old. Um, Sorry, that, where, that, it is the offer in that case. That's because the offer is a child offer uh, related to a junior. Uh, okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. All right. So it's, it's not incorrect. They're just using, uh, using it in a different way to everybody else, right? Um, whereas GLL have got the kind of widest range, uh, zero to one, one to four, 11 to 15, 16 to 55, five to 10, eight, very specific, uh, 55. Um, so it's not widely used at the moment. Um, so there's some benefits there in that we could be encouraging some best practice, but the, I think the issue is, is that trying to agree on a set of useful age ranges is going to be quite tricky. Um, but we know that being able to um, identify events that are for children versus adults and specific age ranges of children is something that people need to do. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to just see if people had um, any uh, thoughts around that. Um, to, to kind of kick things off, I've had a look to see if there are any age ranges that people are using. Um, one, uh, one place is, um, oh, bear with me. Uh, sorry, I'm having um, UI issues. Um, so the Office of National Statistics have a set of age ranges that they use for doing some of their um, statistical reporting. Um, uh, let me just share again. I right, hope you can see that. There's a, there's a table there on the, the, the values that are, I think could be useful will be the ones that they've put down as Principle 13, Principle 4, there's quite a, a detailed set of age ranges there. Um, so while I don't think we can necessarily mandate a set of range, eight ranges, having a useful default might be useful if um, people are going, we're going to be suggesting people be a bit clear about how this is published. So that's one option. Um, another option would be to, in addition to um, leaving age range as it is, would be to um, add a new property that refers to uh, UK school years, so child school years, so kind of like um, the key stage, kind of key stage one, key stage two, um, or year one, year two, year three, et cetera, ranges, um, because that might be a, a more uh, understandable and a kind of acceptable way to specify events for children specifically, whilst leaving people to um, use age range for kind of, you know, a much broader set of use cases. Um, but th those are the only two kind of examples I, I, I've been able to dig out around um, existing kind of recommendations. Um, I mean, you can see from what people are putting in that it's like oddly specific, well, feel, what feels to me like oddly specific, like eight uh, and exactly 55, um, where I suspect that might actually be under eight or over eight or 55 plus or something i don't know yeah according to the spec from when i was reading it yesterday if there's no range given that's the lower bound of the age range yeah okay so uh, so there's a I, i've got some some feedback on that actually um everybody that looks at the uh, age range property in our spec has the same comment and it's like what uh of the, of the format with the hyphen um and uh, if, if you look at schema, uh, there are places where, so there is actually a property called child min age and another property called child max age that are already defined in schema.org. Um, and there's also max value and min value defined um, on 
quantitative value in other other places where there's max and min. So there, there's this kind of pattern of max um, as a prefix and min as a prefix before the thing. Um, and so given the number of people that have implemented this so far, I wonder whether, I, I, I mean, it might be a bold proposal, but it, having a separate max and min uh, <laughs> field might simplify this from data consumers perspective especially so you don't have to worry about exactly like you were saying with um, the ambiguity there what does it mean if there's just a number um that people are implementing it right and also you can actually validate it because you can have two integers uh at the moment we've got a kind of string parsing which everyone's gonna have to implement custom to both serialize and deserialize which i mean i just it's kind of I'm trying to figure out the benefit of having that extra serialization step in there and what it gives us versus the what seems like consistency uh, and uh, ease of use on the other side. Speaking of a data consumer, I'd much prefer that. Two separate fields um, and no additional parsing. Okay. Yeah, and I think I mean, from thinking about search, if you've got two integer values to represent max and min, it's far easier to write something that will do numerical comparisons within search. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, I agree as well. Uh, as a consumer of all of the feeds, it would just be, and we've got a, an age range search on our API, so. Um, yeah, two numerical values are, it would definitely be easier to implement and use. Okay, that's well, that sounds like a pretty broad agreement to me. Uh, so let's um, let's go in that direction. Um, uh, just to uh, dig into a, a little bit of detail there, would you prefer to have age range min, age range max as two properties, or age range, which is a structured value that has min and max in it? So, you know, adjacent object with minimum. I think the latter for me. The latter. The yeah. Yeah. Okay. What does yeah. that mean if the structured object is, I'm just thinking about use cases. If the object is, so if there's not a maximum min age, are we expecting an empty object or not an object? Uh, I guess not an object. Uh, just trying to think of the different, does that create more scenarios if you've got a structured property that then uh, you have to worry about? Um, well, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's going to add anything that having two separate properties wouldn't also have. Okay. I mean, if you have an object and you try to look for two, and it's an empty object, and you try to look for a key that isn't there, you're just going to get null back anyway. So you know that it isn't being passed through. Okay, great. Um, a decision has been made, I think. Um, so, right, I'll, um, I'll file an issue and do some updates to the spec then on that, on that basis. Um, great, okay. Uh, if time, let's move forward quick. Sorry, um, Lee, can you, can you hear me? Pardon? Hello, it's, it's Andy from Active Devon. I'm very happy with the discussion that so far about the, the way the data is handled. I'm just a little concerned about the uh, a number of nulls. Um, and clearly with uh, putting a safeguarding hat on, um, there's great significance in whether an event is appropriate for under 18s or not in terms of what may or may not be um, uh, needed to be provided and I'm just con concerned about consumers searching for stuff finding things and then actually discovering that actually it's an adult event um, So yeah, I'm more concerned by the, the the fact that there's so many nulls in when you've looked at what data is being uh, posted Yeah, so that's um, I, I think I just mean people aren't I, well, they're, they're, if they have the data, they're not publishing it. I, don't, I guess we don't know whether they have it internally and they've just not surfaced it. Um, so uh, uh, what, what, what it might be is we, we might need to be clear perhaps in the stand about what should be assumed if, it's, if it is null, that maybe it, the safe position would be to assume that it is 18 plus 
if it's null and then people who are offering children's services and stuff would would need to have the discipline to actually put the data there yeah i think that, that that's great advice um i was look when i was doing my kind of background work i was trying to find see if there were any specific age ranges that were that touched on some of those kind of um you know, social care insurance and other kind of you know child protection kind of use cases but i couldn't surface anything um but i, I think as long as we've got that clear guidance um to people then um hopefully we'll kind of mitigate any potential problems so I'm, i'll make sure that goes in okay um just wanted to pull on um on um because I know we were looking at categories of ages as well. Um, it, it, Dom Versive, because I know he's looking at this, isn't he, for Public Health England, is that right? Uh, yes, he is. Hi, Nick. Hey, yeah. Uh, do you have any, any comments on the kind of, on the age categorization? Because I know that's something that you're particularly focused on. Yeah, I think um, we're actually speaking to Public Health England about this this morning. Um, we highlighted that Hoop was a great example of an organization that uses age ranges brilliantly. And it's the focus of their search is where it starts. Um, in terms of some of the data that we're analysing, and, and it's been highlighted in, in what Dan's been sharing, is there are a wide range, and it is, uh, I think, pointed to Andy's point. It's like how how do we know what we should be categorising it into? If it is a lot of the time, it's okay. So one to four, fine. Five to eight, fine. Uh, eight to sixteen, yeah, okay. And then. 8 to 55 yeah where do you draw the line how are we supposed to be putting that session into an activity finder who is targeted for it might be because it's a child friendly and family friendly session which is great um are we then tagging it as family friendly are we tagging it as child friendly so from this just from one lack of clarity in the data comes a whole number of other questions and you have to then delve deeper into the, the data set and we're looking at like descriptions and going really granular to say, well, actually this swim for all, it says eight to 55. Um, but we can see that it's, it's specifically for uh, a set age range. It says in the description. So it's, um, I've, I've rambled a little bit there. I'm not entirely sure what the question was, but just sharing some learnings. It's, it's a really, it's an interesting problem. It's if we solve it, it will make things so easy because we'll be able to just give organizations that want specific age ranges, we'll just be able to give it to them directly. At the moment, we're having to kind of filter through and just tag by different, you know, a child, generic child's activity up to, and this is the question about safeguarding, up to an age of maybe 16 or 18. Um, so if we could have then have this solved in, in such a way that you can have plus eight. So I think it's important to have the min and the max separated out because you can have plus eight, fine, then you don't want toddlers or infants there, but up to eight, then you can include, you know, we can have some uh, toddlers and infants. So it's, it's a really interesting problem. Uh, yeah, and I hope, I hope that's been somewhat helpful. <laughs> I tend to just ramble when I get on these, uh, when I get the opportunity to speak. So I think that's why they keep me in a box here. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, so, so I think there's, there's it, from the sound of it, there's also a bit of feedback that we can be given to publishers around, you know, if, if people are putting, different age ranges in their descriptions than in the data, then that's something that's not right. So there's some data quality things to sort out there. But again, it's one of those things that are, it's not something you can necessarily validate for. It's about just generally improving the kind of quality that people are collecting kind of upstream. Um, so I think we just kind of need to, I think we need like generally need to be aware of some of these issues when they come up, because some of them are just about engaging with people to improve their best practices. Um, and some of it will be stuff that you know we can be quite prescriptive at in terms of um, you know how we how we validate and where we work with the data. So yeah, I, I, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head there, uh, Lee. It's exactly it's we've done so well in the past with um, kind of setting out the specification and educating. If we can go to the provider and say, if you just make this tiny change and, and make your data all the information you're putting in in the future. If you put an age range in, then it will go to X, Y, Z. It will mean that these organizations can use it more easily, more seamlessly, hopefully then drive more search and, and hopefully booking as well. So I think that's it. It's, it's going and, and getting, especially as well, really drum up the support amongst the data consumers, the people that want to have these sessions on their websites, get them behind this, going with the ODI saying, GLL Fusion, your data is amazing. 
it would be even better and we can serve this population, this demographic, if you were to X, Y, Z, put, you know, 8 to 15 or whatever it is. So I, I, I think you're exactly right there. Great. Cool. Um, yeah, the, the, the probably scope to, to do some, some stuff like that in the in whatever validation tools we build. You know, a, a kind of traditional validator will just give you valid, not valid, and maybe a reason why something's invalid. But we need to be thinking about what's missing and then making the argument about why you would add that stuff in. Um, people not, might not be able to do that, but being able to point to reasons why I think is good. So that's why we need to be thinking about more than just that kind of validate it against a schema, which is a very kind of strict kind of view of the world, something that's a bit more flexible. Um, right. The, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, uh, amenities. So kind of uh, uh, list of kind of yeah, amenities associated with a particular facility. Um, so again, this has come up from uh, some of the engagement work Nick's been doing. Um, there's an example, uh, there's an example a link from the slides I'll circulate. Um, but basically, people often need to know um, what other amenities are available. So changing facilities, showers, toilets, parking, a whole bunch of stuff. There is some um, functionality for this already in schema.org. Um, there's just switching here to a, some example that Nick put together that kind of shows that. So schema.org has this idea of a amenity feature and you can um, indicate whether that feature is available. So you give it a name um, and indicate uh, whether it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's there or not at that particular um, venue. So I think this is one, this is something new that we want to start uh, documenting as a, a kind of pattern for people to adopt um, in order to kind of help uh, specify some of this, it would be useful to know what types of amenities we should be um, uh, we should be including or getting people to include. So <clears throat> I, I think we don't we don't have to describe uh, decide this now. Um, but you know any feedback or thoughts would be useful. But like here's a starter for ten of the kinds of things that we think should be indicated. Um, and I think again, ideally, it would be nice if people are indicating explicitly whether these are available or not um, where they can. Um, just to kind of add a bit more context to the, the location information. Um, does, does anyone have any thoughts about other amenities that should be on that list? Baby changing. Baby changing, yeah. As a, as a new dad, always important. Um, equipment hire. Um, the parking, do you want to split that out into pay and display uh, or free parking? Uh, that's a good question. Um, or no parking. <coughs> that can be useful. You might be, able to put a, you might be able to put a property on the parking itself to say what type of parking it is. Maybe there was a bit of some value. Yeah. yeah, so we could be saying, you know, that... Um, yeah, it's sort of property on here. Because what, what to, maybe just to kind of clarify a little bit, what schema.org says you should do is have an array of your amenity features, and it just recommends using uh, a name and a value. Um, but not, I'm not convinced that that's um, uh, will be clearly defined or not, because people will end up having uh, different names for things. So I'd sooner have a specific type that we can validate against. Instead, so that's why the reason I'm kind of leaning towards having a list in the spec. Um, but we can include parking, and we can define some extra, extra properties if if it's useful. Uh, also, check BBC Get Inspired out. Uh, they've got a list of amenities on their site. Okay. Okay. That, I think that's a good start to ten. Sorry, Lee. Um, Sorry, Lee. It's Andy again. Um, just, I, I'm wondering whether this is the right place as well for picking up facilities that might, or amenities that might be um, th things like dementia friendly, or those issues that would be key search criteria for some people. 
if, if, if you go to the class finder uh, thing, Lee, there's a spe yep. search for the word special. So, oh, it's down there. You see special requirements, beta. Uh, that, that is exactly the use case that they're trying to solve for this. I, I don't know, Phil, whether that's gone into to beta yet, but certainly that those values, dementia friendly, exist in that field. Uh, and they, they were proposing that this is something that we should be, for a, a number of things, um, kind of able to filter on. It's different to uh, accessibility requirements because accessibility is a very specific thing. Um, this is more health related. Thank you, but uh, that will also then, uh, I think what you're describing here, Nick, is a, feat, is a property of the event. So I think Andy was, uh, Andy, were you suggesting that there might be that information might be associated with the location? Um, yes, it, it could be for, for example, with the, it, um, with typically with leisure, cent leisure centres, they might well have been uh, dementia friendly. There's various mental health um, initiatives as well. So that the, the staff have all been trained and so on. Um, so it's, it's a feature more of the location in that case than just uh, specific events. So there will be also specific events. Okay. Okay, interesting. Do you know if there's a standard set of values for that, that kind of information? Uh, not that I'm aware of, um, but I can make a couple of inquiries. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Nick, for this, this example, the, course find, the class finder, um, if they've got a list of values it might be useful to know so um yeah they've got those uh, we'll make sure if um uh yeah we'll make sure to put that in the in the beta thing if that's not already gone into the beta uh, yeah should... yeah so there's like 10 or 10 or so i think okay um so um for the purposes of time i'm gonna i'm gonna move us on uh, that's I, i'm sorry just leave one one quick quick one what about floodlights where would that go? So I got missed off um, the uh, active places data. Good. Yeah, I, I don't see why floodlights couldn't be. Yeah, I don't see why could, floodlights couldn't be. I'll stick it on the list and then we'll see if anyone's unhappy. Um, any other comments on amenities? Okay, um, then in the time we've got left, um, I was, Nick, I was, are you happy to give us an update on where you are with the booking work? It's going to be the most rapid booking update you've ever seen. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, don't worry, it's fine. Uh, and I think it's probably good to keep it at a high level anyway. Um, uh, so the booking 0.4 spec uh, we've been um, working on um, and uh, I'm, I'm really working to, I don't know if you were going to say this Lee, but we're keen to get a, a little bit of a workshop together where we can go through this. Um, and uh, you want to say something about that now, Lee? Um, yeah, so, um, so, uh, so we've been doing some work, as you know, from like previous calls, we've been doing some work with um, people to do some kind of prototyping around getting an initial version of a API up and running, kind of test the waters a bit. Um, uh, Phil's been doing some, well, Phil and Nick and Chris have all been doing some work to build on that. Um, and we're getting kind of ready to share that more widely. Um, but what we're keen to do as well as kind of doing some regular check-ins and discussions on these calls, um, actually have uh, kind of uh, at least one, maybe several face-to-face -face sessions. So we're gonna organize a, a technical workshop either for middle or the end of April, just to get people in a room um, so that we can just have a kind of more higher bandwidth conversation, use the whiteboard, wave our hands a bit, uh, and make sure that we can kind of get into more of the detail than we can do on these kind of hourly, fortnightly calls. Um, we'll, still, we'll still have regular check-ins, but it, it worked well for doing the general requirements gathering, so keen to do it uh, as we get, uh, get into more of the detail. So we'll, we'll put a general invite out for people, but um, get, get in touch after the call if you are interested in coming to that. Great, fantastic, yes, absolutely. So um, that would be, that'd be really good. You just click the UI button, Lee, so we um, don't blind people with YAML. Uh, oh, but that's the best bit, <laughs> go on. <laughs> <laughs> that's where the real stuff happens. 
Um, I just want to take you through some key features of this in very, very quickly, uh, and just some things that are a bit interesting about what we've learned. Um, one of the first things to say is this spec covers more than just the, the orders endpoint. It actually includes some um, recommendations around servicing data so that you can browse and find that data as well. Uh, so locations and sessions endpoints both allow you to search for sessions, search for locations. Um, if you just click on sessions, linking to one of the points that Dan made earlier about the consistency of where you find a location, um, if you just scroll down to the example, something that we've we put in here that we're, we're, as a proposal, which we'll put somewhere as well. If you just scroll down to where it says facilities um, under location, is this idea that, there you go, the facility, is this idea that the um, an event can occur in more than one facility. So that might be lane one, two, and three of a bowling alley, or it might be um, swimming pool lanes, it might be te tennis, it might be badminton courts, it might be court one to four. Um, and so because there's an array of things, it's quite difficult to put that in the position that GLL has got it, um, where there's an array that then contained in place, et cetera. Um, and so the, the, re the um, proposal here is to split that out so that rather than having the kind of nested structure that we've got with GLL, um, we actually specify this facility separately. Um, and, uh, and that's something that can then be an array of, although it's not an array here, but it should be an array of um, facilities, um, such as a swimming pool. Um, also, um, in the case of theme park, which was a use case we came across, uh, that, that facility could actually be in a different place. So a geo, there's geo on there because the location is the location of the uh, theme park main entrance, and then the facility might have the, I don't know, whatever the thing is in the theme park. Location. Um, so that's just something to highlight. Um, that's something that's interesting. Feedback welcome on this. Um, if we keep going through, so um, scrolling down to uh, the orders endpoints, just to take you through the flow really quickly. Um, it's the same as it was before. Create an order with a post. Um, uh, the order items can now be updated um, by adding, you can add order items to an order, or you can delete them. When you're ready to finish the order, slightly different to what we had before, but the same workflow, you submit a payment by posting to payments, and that then completes the order. So you're not no longer posting as we were before to say, the order's completed because that's kind of the wrong, the control's in slightly the wrong place. So rather than us telling us the booking system that the order's completed, we actually give the booking system the payment, the booking system tells us, the data consumer, that the order's completed. Um, the other interesting thing about this is that um, often there's a use case around making the a list of uh, sessions, like bookable sessions available, so you can see what, what's coming up. So you might have made an order today for a session in two weeks' time, or maybe that order includes two sessions, one for a fortnight, one for, 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 for a week from now. And, and then the reservations endpoints, which are just above where it says orders there, they cover that use case. So that's that's allowing you to get reservations, uh, which and reservations in this context are the actual bookable things that you've got booked. So you can just say, you know, what am I going to this week? And then you can get that information out. Um, I think that's... Uh, how does this work for um, sessions that are entirely free? That is a fantastic question and something that we haven't quite figured out for payment yet. If we post a null payment is currently the answer, um, but we're not sure whether that's so feedback welcome on that, um, whether it makes sense to post a null payment. We had this big debate before about whether we make a separate whole thing about free sessions as a separate um, use, whether we allow uh, the completion of an order. Uh, without that so a post it because it already advertises a, a null payment offer sorry a null value offer so it's like there's a free offer so we're paying it with a null value kind of makes sense what do you think okay uh i think it's a bit misleading um but uh, yeah something something we can obviously get over uh, it's not the end of the world but mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to think about it a bit more, having seen it about ten seconds ago. That's well. Please do, and absolute feedback on the mailing list or or, or GitHub or or Slack or any of the any of the channels. That would be very much appreciated. Um, so just, just to check uh, the slash payments, the they don't 
whoever influence slash payments isn't handling the payment are they or are they handling the payment no no it's a submission of payment so you're saying i've i've you're, you're just saying that the payment has occurred okay and here it is. yeah Although, although actually this also allows you to store payment, store card details within the booking system and use them in the payment. So you can do both. Uh, in, it, I mean, it can, it can handle the payment if the payment is an internal one that doesn't require outbound uh, payment mechanism. Okay. Um, and if you scroll up slightly, you'll see that, that endpoint I just talked about. Uh, there's a customer's endpoint there with payment methods and you can use those payment methods to make those internal payments. Um, you can also get orders related to the customer and you can get reservations related to the customer to see those upcoming sessions. The whistle stop tour just in, just in time. But hopefully that helps you kind of... Uh, the next steps for this are we're going to get a Google Doc uh, written up which has got a lot of this content in and circulated um, aiming for the end of this week. Uh, this has already gone to the mailing list so absolutely please comment back, uh, reply with any thoughts because I know we're out of time now. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and and comment on the Google Doc as well when we get that out. Um, so this is this is just 0 0.4. This still isn't like version one, um, but we're, we we seem to be converging with the different implementers that uh, we're, we're talking to. That's something that kind of works for all cases because this seems to be quite a few. Um, Great. Okay. Um, is there anything else that uh, anyone? Uh, wanted to say today, but haven't had a chance to do so. Nope. Um, okay. Just a prompt, uh, uh, Siv. I don't know if you wanted to comment on schedule, recurring schedules, quickly. Yeah. Um, well, I think I'd love to comment on the um, the the GitHub around uh, events schedules, um, and I think they're still in. Pending, um, pending dot schema dot org, um, but yeah, it would be it would be great if um, things like date were made mandatory um, because uh, expanding a, a schedule into its individual occurrences, um, you don't you never know when to stop. Basically, so you can get an almost infinite number of schedule uh, occurrences. Um, and I think there's also making a duration mandatory for those that cross over the midnight boundary. Uh, that makes it horrible to calculate. But things like that, I, I think if you if you know the start time and the end time, it shouldn't be too difficult to fit that in. Um, and definitely the end date. Uh, if event schedules is something that is going to be widely implemented across uh, providers. Yeah. Okay. So did you put you put that detail in in GitHub? Uh, I think I have started to. Um, okay, great. I, I'll, I'll see what I've put in and add to it if I've missed something. Okay, great. A bit, a bit of further context there is that if, if you've got a, a place that you can put free events, which allows for an infinite recurrence, that can create problems because you might put that in two years ago and not touch it because it's free and why would you? Uh, and so data becomes invalid and therefore less useful. And so it's not so bad with something like Bookwen where there's a credit card attached because presumably people are still paying the thing, so it's probably still good. But a lot of the free listing systems like Forestry Commission, uh, Open Sessions, um, Canal River Trust, those guys have just got systems you can just list sessions on. And so there's a risk there that um, it's just going to become not useful because there's going to be a 24-month-old recurring event that no one knows what to do with and probably just is going to be arbitrarily ignored by different data users based on different rules because they're obviously not, it's not valid, can't still be running or maybe it is, but it's unlikely. Um, so it might be worth making that explicit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We might need some just <laughs> consistent processing rules. I mean, if people don't, if there, if it generally is open-ended, then it's open-ended. Um, but uh, agreeing that, um, you know, you might, uh, if you're indexing, if you want to index individual events, then how far ahead you go, having some default rules for that sounds reasonable. Um, but uh, yeah, I take your point about stuff that's just scale. Um, that almost feels like 
uh, a separate issue because you could have that with an end date. Somebody could put an end date for 10 years time and it still might not be a real event. So, uh, okay. All right. Um, that was good. Some, uh, good, useful discussion on the call today. Um, so thanks all of you for coming along. Thanks Dan for the demo. Um, I'll follow up with the slides after the call with the links to Dan's reports. Uh, um, Swagger, if he's not been circulated already, uh, and the other documents we've shown. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks again, and see, the, see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.